Of all the long-legged wading birds, perhaps the most instantly recognisable is the spoonbill. No other bird has a beak quite like it. There are some six species of this remarkable bird spread across the warmer parts of the world. In Florida lives the roseate spoonbill, a spectacular pink species. South of the Sahara is occupied by the African spoonbill, characterized by its pale beak and red face. But the most widespread species is the Eurasian spoonbill that's found across North Africa, Europe and Asia, as far east as the China Sea and as far south as Sri Lanka. The coast of northwest Africa is an important breeding ground for this bird. But every year, a small, distinct group of spoonbills heads off northwards. Their destination, the Netherlands, where they will feed and breed among the reedy dikes and wetlands in the northernmost part of their range. It's here that Dutch conservationists have gone to extraordinary lengths to save the spoonbill. As dawn breaks over the polders, unmistakable silhouettes appear from the gloom. The Dutch landscape is dominated by waterways and wetlands. The ideal habitat for many species of marsh plants, some widespread, like the thrift and the cornflower, Others rarer, such as marsh orchids and night orchids. Sundews thrive in the wet soil. So too does the cotton grass. Much of the country lies below sea level. Beyond the fragile dunes, the North Sea pounds away relentlessly. Only careful engineering and constant management prevents erosion and the sea from flooding in. Large areas of land have been claimed from the sea. It's to this patchwork of marshland and shallow lagoons, crisscrossed by a regimented network of reed-lined dikes and canals, that the spoonbills return every year. Early spring marks their arrival. The birds have made their way from their wintering grounds in Mauritania and Senegal, northwards through Morocco, Spain and France, following the coast until they arrive here, the northernmost limit of their breeding range. Over 300 pairs breed here in the Netherlands, almost twice as many as in the 1960s, when pollution in general, and insecticides in particular, caused a sharp decline in their numbers. Since then, the spoonbill population has been growing steadily. The birds return to breed in a variety of habitats that include islands, inaccessible reed beds, low trees, and sand dunes. At Les Plaplassen, around 50 pairs breed among the reed beds, alongside a colony of cormorants. It's mid-May, and while some of the cormorants have paired up, others have yet to find a mate.
By now, the majority of the spoonbills are in pairs, and nests are being constructed on or near the ground. Cormorants nest in trees directly above the spoonbill colony, using twigs and reeds and whatever other bits and pieces they can manage to find. During the breeding season, both male and female spoonbills develop an orange collar, a yellow throat and a crest of long, narrow feathers. Mating takes place regularly during the course of the nest construction. The magnificent black beak is in fact slightly open when viewed from the side. The nest is almost complete and the female tries it for size. Both sexes help in the collection of material for the nest. By now, some females have already produced their first eggs, but it doesn't pay to leave the nest unattended for too long, even for a short bathe. Herring gulls are notorious egg thieves and are quick to pounce on any unguarded eggs. It's not a disaster for the spoonbill. She'll lay three or four eggs in total, one every two or three days. A chick should start to hatch in a little over three weeks from now. It's now mid-June, and at the spoonbill colony at Des Moines on the island of Texel, the chicks are growing well. Here, two dozen pairs of birds nest in the tops of elder bushes close to the water's edge. Some of the earlier birds to arrive already have quite large chicks, and yet others are still sitting on eggs. Over at Le Plaplassen, most of the chicks have hatched. Their curious spoon-shaped beak will develop as they grow. At this age, they're fed on semi-regurgitated food, so a large beak would only be a handicap for both parent and chick. The adults began to incubate as soon as the first egg appeared, so there can be as much as a week's difference in age between the oldest and the youngest chick. Both parents share the task of feeding the offspring and keeping the nest clean. Although spoonbills breed in colonies, they're very possessive about their own territory and even more so about their nest. Spoonbills are constantly trying to steal their neighbor's nest material. Spoonbill colonies are surprisingly quiet places. The chick's food call is quite soft and the adults rarely make a sound at all. <laughs> 
Most of the noise here comes from the cormorants nesting close by. Many of the young birds are still trying to master the art of handling nest building material. It does help if the twig isn't actually still growing. Adult cormorants are quite magnificent birds, as sharp-eyed as any eagle. Their offspring are still a little ungainly. The Phragmites reed beds that abound in this part of the Netherlands are a haven for other bird life. A party of bearded tits passes through. They're always associated with Phragmites, and outside the breeding season, they move around in troops of a dozen or so. By the end of June, the spoonbill chicks are almost as big as their parents. On Tuscheling, one of the Wadden Sea Islands, the birds nest on a remote sandy dune, well away from any form of disturbance. The large chicks follow their parents around, bobbing their heads up and down in the hope of being fed. Eventually, the parent gives in. Herring gulls also nest here amid the marram grass and, given the chance, steal spoonbill eggs, but they do provide an early warning against predators. Other neighbours are less destructive. Every time an adult bird lands in the colony, it's instantly harassed by its chicks. Any day now, the chicks will follow their parents on fishing trips to learn how to use their highly specialised beak. Almost all the birds in this colony have been ringed. It's one of the few places where scientists can reach them without causing too much disturbance. Some of these birds were ringed 11 years ago. The chicks receive their rings just before they're fledged, but after they've reached a size when disturbance could cause the adults to desert. From this work, we now know that this chick has only a one in five chance of returning to the island to breed. It appears that 80% of spoonbills die during the first four years of their life and never reach sexual maturity. In contrast to their African wintering grounds, where they feed exclusively in the sea, the Dutch spoonbills feed both in salt and in fresh water. Spoonbills eat a wide variety of food, such as crustaceans, insect larvae, tadpoles, frogs, and small fish. The shallow lagoons are an ideal place for them to feed. Here, the majority of their diet is made up of fish, and sticklebacks in particular. But sticklebacks are migratory fish and move from fresh to seawater with the seasons. In the lagoons, they no longer have access to the sea, essential for good breeding success, so their numbers are limited. Towards the end of the bird's breeding season, their numbers may drop to levels critical for the spoonbills. Water levels in the canals and lakes are also carefully controlled. 
around a quarter of a million cubic meters of water flows out, lowering the water level by 15 centimeters, and so concentrating the fish. So although there are fewer fish, they're now easier for the birds to catch. Areas that were once too deep for the spoonbills to feed in are now accessible. Marsh plants like the fleawort spring up on exposed mud. But these fish haven't been left high and dry. They're spawning in the warm shallows. offspring are also part of the spoonbill's diet. Young carp, zander and bream are an important source of food for the birds as the stickleback numbers drop. A huge female carp is being pursued by several smaller males. As she scatters her spawn, the males fertilize the eggs. By late summer, the water levels in the lagoons are low and the birds can find food more easily. It's now that the chicks accompany their parents to the water in search of food. Feeding in the muddy water doesn't worry the birds. Their beak is very sensitive, and prey is found by touch. They've learned to dabble a little themselves, but they still rely on the adults for much of their food. At first, the adults and chicks move to feeding grounds close to the nest area. Later, they'll travel together further afield in search of prey. It's been estimated that a spoonbill catches, on average, two sticklebacks every minute. Given that they spend up to eight hours a day foraging, that could be as many as a thousand fish per bird per day. A colony of 50 spoonbills probably gets through over a million sticklebacks a month. In ditches that have direct access to the sea, this doesn't appear to be a problem for the birds. There's a constant influx of fish from salt to fresh water during the summer. But in the open freshwater lagoons, the number of sticklebacks is more or less finite. Any moves to allow salt water into the dike system is vigorously resisted by the local farmers who use the water on their land. The heron picks off fish one at a time. The spoonbills scoop them up. The spoonbill has two different feeding techniques. For small prey, the beak is swung from side to side until it touches something moving in the muddy water. The bird swallows small items of prey in the head down position. Larger fish are detected in the same way, but then chased until caught.
If it's a stickleback, its spines are crushed before being swallowed. Here the birds continue to feed and build up their reserves for the long journey back to West Africa. Throughout September, small parties will head off in groups of between 10 and 100 westwards along the coast. Some may turn up in England, in the Fens and along the coastline of East Anglia. The birds coast hop, feeding in estuaries along the coasts of France, Spain and Portugal. If the spoonbill is to survive in Europe, it's essential that these areas are protected too. By autumn, they'll be in Mauritania, where they'll spend the winter living and feeding entirely in salt water. Others may go on to Senegal, Guinea-Bissau and the Gambia. Like most other ibises and herons, spoonbills worldwide are under threat from the drainage and pollution of their wetland habitat. But by constant protection and habitat management, the Dutch conservationists have been able to save their spoonbill. <laughs>